Uh, I'm not sure how the PowerPoint is going to work. I guess when we talk, we'll just yeah. go through it. And yeah, they're out. only about nine, ten, so you can it just rotates and. Okay, great. But then nine, ten, can... exceptional pictures. <laughs> <laughs> well, my name is Benton Lynch, and thank you for coming. And it is. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, begin this by saying when I was nine or ten years old, something like that, I was in my cousin's basement and she had a bunch of Archie comics. And since, you know, since I was a guy, I read Superman and Batman. But comics were comics and I devoured them. And there was a Madhouse annual that I saw. And I distinctly remember there was a story, and at the tender age of, like I said, nine or ten, the punchline was a guy in a time loop that didn't mind he was in the final loop because he was able to have his cake and eat it too. <laughs> and I thought that was so clever and so funny that it stuck with me. And, and to this day, I still think it's funny and very clever. And I was thrilled to find out that the gentleman next to me was the guy that wrote that story. And as you'll find out, he's had a, a very interesting uh, career. I told George earlier, that my apologies that we have to rush through a lot of stuff because we could be here all afternoon because he's had such a rich career. But it is my honor to introduce George Glider. And uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to say that uh, we got to know each other very well. So we're going to. All right, so I understand that you were a comics fan when you were a kid. Oh yeah, um, it so happens that my parents uh, were Russian and they were used to the uh, Cyrillic alphabet and they, um, uh, they could read English but there weren't any books in English in our household so right off the bat I would, when I was four years old my mother was reading Tarzan to me from the Russian newspaper. Hmm. My father had uh, would, would get the, the Daily Mirror and the Daily News, and New York papers, and I peruse the comic strip. So, uh, comics uh, were my outlet for reading uh, back then before books. I I didn't start reading novels until I was around nine. And, um, well, comics up. But you're a unique comic fan because you bought comics before Action Number One came out. Oh yeah, I have. <laughs> what should we call it? Uh, uh, my father worked on the railroad, and we we had this pass, and my mother would uh, make frequent trips to Philadelphia, and she'd always buy me this uh, famous funnies. I think that was the name of it. Right. Um, that had to be the early 30s, a big 64-page comic book per time, and they reprinted Sunday comics, so I got, you know, a constant reader of that uh, uh, comic book. Yeah, and then, then there were others uh, um, before, Detective Comics was one of the earliest ones, and I vaguely recall a, um, a comic book that I, I think Siegel and Schuster put out. It was legal size and it was black and white. I, I wouldn't swear to it, but that, yeah. that was, and that, that had to be the, uh, 34, 33, somewhere around. Yeah, if, if there's any comics historian, because I, I, I seem to remember reading that before Superman there was like a black and white. So we'll have to ask. Well, uh, look, in the back of more fun, the original tabloid size ones, they did have black and white inserts. They did the Doctor Cult. Many of right. were Doc were hmm. Siegel and Schuster, and they were black and white. Maybe that's uh, and it was pre Superman. It is pre Superman. Yes. <coughs> yeah, I do. I mean, you don't remember a real yeah. story. <laughs> Watch my cameo with Bill. Yes. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, so is that weird? Not many people know that you want to uh, be a cartoonist. Uh, yeah. Uh, at the outset. Uh, you know, I ignored uh, English writing courses that I could have taken in college and high school. I was, uh, in fact, I went to Stuyvesant High School, which is the, probably the number one science 
high school in the country. <laughs> Only because it was two blocks away from where I lived that I could sleep a little longer. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. My, my apologies. So w where, where did you grow up? In Manhattan. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, that was my um, introduction to uh, uh, what you might call it. You got bit by the comics, but, yeah. but, but you want a cartoon. Oh, yeah. Um, as a you know, cartoonist, I took these art courses and I was really satisfied in high school. Well, especially at Stuyvesant, you know, you draw dishes and that had nothing to do with cartoons. <laughs> and um, what you would call it, I, I got the Cooper Union. They had a, a great science school, but they also had an art school. I went there evenings when, um, when I was 16 after I graduated from high school. And I was bored to tears with the introductory uh, sculpture, architecture, creative design, painting. And um, I should have gone to music and art there. Uh, I might have run into Harvey Kurtzman and uh, John Severn and a few of the other big names, but I didn't. So, but your first job in comics was at the uh, and Iger studio. Yeah. Uh, well, while I was going evenings to Cooper Union, uh, what year, what year are we talking about? 1942. I was, uh, let's see, uh, about 17 at the time. Uh, I got this job as an apprentice uh, uh, working. Oh, and an interesting fact, the way uh, comic studio, uh, production studios were working then, they'd have about the entire staff of Jumbo Comics in a room about the third of the size of a Oh, about this size. And uh, everybody would, you know, the inkers and the uh, pencilers and the letterers and uh, uh, the golfers like myself were all in this one room. And in the center was the letterer. I, re I remember his name, but my short time memory. It was in the Eisner studio. I, I already. Yeah, Eisner and Iger. He was, Eisner was in the army at that time, 42. And uh, so I never did have the privilege of meeting him. But you dealt with Iger? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I tried to figure out who the letterer was. It wasn't Abe Kennison or Sam Rosen. And I can't, hmm. uh, again, any historians here, uh, the other ben, staff. Ben Oda was around, but I don't think who, who? Ben Oda was around, but, but I don't think it wasn't yeah. Ben Oda. Yeah, it wasn't Ben Oda. Mm -hmm. All right, well, anyone watching this or and run into anybody ex them, but, but you were there uh, for how long? Oh, just a few months. Uh, I, I, before I went into the Army, I, I volunteered at uh, the age of 18, uh, wound up in the infantry. So uh, you had an interesting experience during your, uh, were you shipped overseas? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, fortunately, uh, enlisting uh, before D-Day, no, no, uh, 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 enlisting when I did, uh, I was able to go to an infantry outfit uh, training in uh, Georgia. And uh, I got to know the, uh, uh, the personnel. Uh, you know, your sergeant and whatnot. Uh, many of uh, my high school classmates who uh, waited to be drafted uh, were drafted in uh, a number of months later, and many of them were uh, shipped right overseas and uh, joined their outfits uh, on the front lines and didn't know anybody. And it, it was just pure luck that. Uh, by enlisting early, I uh, <laughs> was able to, to avoid that fiasco. Yeah, mm -hmm. but but it wasn't all uh, uh, roses. Oh no! What no. happened uh, for 16 days? Yeah, I was a POW, a POW for 16 mm -hmm. days, mm -hmm. and it, it was the most interesting period, uh, maybe of my life uh, in, in some respects, because. Uh, it, I, I, uh, I was captured near a uh, submarine city, uh, Loria, 
we, the Germans that were, uh, many of the Germans that were routed out of D-Day in Normandy, about 90,000 flocked to these well-fortified uh, seaports, and there was a great deal of confusion there. And I got to intermingle with the Germans and learn them. I learned about them uh, firsthand. And, I'm sure. In, in a concentration camp? No, no. It was, a, yeah. <laughs> it was very. The Isle uh, Ile de Croix in France, uh, in the Near Orient, um, I, I don't think there were more than 20 prisoners. But it, it wasn't just uh, meeting the Frenchmen on this island and uh, the Germans there. There was uh, uh, several days where we wandered around with, with some of the German soldiers. They didn't know what to do with us. We got to talk with them in, in, on intimate terms. And I'll, I'll just give you one brief conversation. We're in the day room, and this young German uh, corporal comes up to us. He spoke in fluent uh, uh, English. And he was in his early 20s, and he sat down with us. And, you know, he wasn't trying to curry favor with us or anything. And he said, you know why we're losing this war? We're screwing ourselves to death in Paris. Mm. <laughs> 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 yeah, but, there were a number of incidents like that, and uh, I, I remember them vividly, and I don't want to go into them now because we, <laughs> yeah, but we're not discussing That's why I said we could be here all afternoon, and I'd love to do a uh, longer interview. Uh, but the nice thing about being in a uh, concentration camp in France is the food must have been good. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, we got things but the Germans. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Uh, I don't know if this is a sensitive subject, but you were uh, you worked for intelligence. Oh, during the war? Hmm. No, that that, uh, that was no. I was uh, straight infantry. When I went back, I, I was so intrigued by the, the German aspect of it that um, after I um, got out of uh, I was at this job in '46, I, I went to NYU for uh, and got my degree there. And I majored in history and, and languages, German and Russian, etc. So, uh, and then I went into the army again uh, as an officer in psychological warfare. Hmm. But that's okay. Now, right, what you you know anything? You, they're all dead now, so you could talk about. Them, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> you spied on. Uh, no, uh, actually, <laughs> psychological warfare was. Uh, is that why you're gonna? Yeah. Let's see, it's payback now. We're blinding uh, our guest of honor here. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We're going to put that on a matter of slide. Okay. And in fact, there is a slide that talks about World War II, shows a cartoon from World War II. Okay. What if George and Batten moved over to the side of the table? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. There you go. It's easier on your eyes. How long do you want to stay on your slide? I think mm. you don't have to stay on so the slide. It's cocktail, and then you can just back. Okay. okay. No, with psychological warfare, it was uh, very interesting. But, you know, this was 1950 um, to 53. I, I, my, there was a Romanian defected from the Olympics and he spoke German and I was with, partially attached to the Voice of America and I interviewed him, etc., etc. And uh, the only interesting, well, uh, a very interesting point here was that I, during that period I was able to look up uh, the officer who was in charge of our POW camp. And I spent the weekend with him and we were chatting and <laughs> About all time. So it's right out of Hogan's here. <laughs> <laughs> right, so from there, though, you went to uh, went to pursue your uh, yeah your oh. vocation as a cartoonist. Oh well, well, I was in the army. I, I started selling gear cartoons to the Army Times. That was that was the big thing uh, during the early fifties for a decade or two after gear cartoons. Uh, these one-panel cartoons. That, uh, 
were featured in uh, Saturday Evening Post, Colliers, etc., and in many magazines. <laughs> so um, that's what I wanted to do. So I, I went to this, um, it was known as uh, Cartoonist, what was it? Uh, yes. No, Cartoonist and Illustrators. Oh, right. Yeah. Which, which is now the School of Visual Arts. Yeah, I went there for a couple of years mm -hmm. and then. Uh, did, did you meet Vern Hoffman? Oh, yeah, yeah. He, uh, he took two classes there, one on gag cartoons, Dave Pascal, a famous gag cartoonist, taught that. And Vern Hogarth taught the uh, illustrating class. Hmm. And, uh, he was the founder of Cartoonist Illustrator School for, if you're wondering why we just mentioned Hogarth out of nowhere, but he was the founder. <laughs> and and he, he taught classes there, too. Yeah, he did the uh, car uh, talks and comics. Yeah. So, getting back to the gay cartoons, but not only were they the, the high uh, slip, the, the, the you know, first rate slips, there were also tiny magazines like Digest Size, uh, yeah. the type men like. <laughs> you, would sell, uh, you would try to sell to those magazines? Yeah, I was, there I was in competition with, uh, even though they paid lo a low rate, uh, uh, that's where all the top. Gay yeah, cartoonists would go to the law when they couldn't sell those script. Do you recall the titles of those? Yeah, Broadway titles? Labs, Army Labs. They had, I think, four books, and uh, uh, they were all bi monthlies. And um, I, I really managed to get in there. The, the editor, Sam Beerman, uh, was a very astute fellow, and I would try to do multi panel, um, like take four panels over. Mm -hmm. uh, a two page spread. And this eventually uh, led into my doing work writing for Crack, which came a few years later. So, in that sense. Well, right. how do you make the segue from, uh, well, here's some, there'll be some cartoons, some of his uh, George's gay yeah, cartoons. Okay. Sure. We'll, we'll take a look at Do you want to discuss them now briefly? or? Well, wait, I want to get to how did you go from being hmm. a gay cartoonist to writing? Uh, uh, okay. Uh, well, then I was selling. I, uh, you know, I could never quit my bank job in the daytime. Although I, I did quit it to work uh, at the bank nights, so that there would be a steady flow of money and, uh, so to speak, yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> switch to trying to sell in the daytime when that's when you you got a chance to see the editors on Wednesday. Okay. And I, with, with some of my classmates, Orlando Bassino, for one, who was a, a, a top flight gag cartoonist. In fact, um, he, he, he's won uh, uh, a number of uh, several awards as gag cartoonist of the year with the cartoonist and uh, SC. But what is the famous uh, car, cartoon uh, organization? Oh, uh, I'm playing into the cartoon. You're seeing an official senior moment here. The cartoonists, uh, the Rubin, uh, the yeah. Cartoonist Society. What, what, National, what cartoonist. National, National Cartoonist. National Cartoonist. National Cartoonist. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thanks for having me. Yeah. Are you a member? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he was a gay cartoonist of the year for a number of years. He was the one who um, he said to me, one day, with, uh, Archie, I hear, is looking uh, for writers. So I uh, uh, decided to go there with some of my samples, and uh, I got taken on as uh, a regular writer. And, uh, so, do you remember the name of the editor that hired you? Uh, Richard Goldwater. He was the son, hmm. uh, uh, the son of the uh, publisher, John Goldwater, and uh, now uh, Another uh, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Goldwater is the uh, the grandson. Yeah, no, not the grandson. Yeah, hmm. uh, he, he, the publisher remarried and had a younger wife. And so maybe we should talk about the younger wife. Then. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, well, well, afterwards, come up. Yeah. John will tell you everything you want. To it's say. a different you should <laughs> mention. Bring up the subject of that it is. Uh, hmm. There was one editor in my mind, 
the couple of editors I, I really uh, enjoyed working with. And the number one editor of all was my wife, Mary Flatter. She did it. <laughs> I had no idea when we were married. You know, she was a, uh, a, a, a writer, I mean, a, a reader of, uh, uh, almost uh, addicted to reading. And uh, she, when I, uh, at Archie, I was doing a lot of one-page stuff, all their cover ideas, and uh, occasionally I'd do a, a Jughead story. And later in the 70s, when I had uh, a chance to expand, um, Mary would uh, uh, point out how I could, uh, you know, I, plots were a novelty to me, and uh, she gave me invaluable tips on how to, uh, uh, you know, what I should be doing, how I should be setting up a story. So stand up so everybody can see. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm giving kudos to uh, my wife, that my daughter Nina is helping me enter the, the um, Digital age of uh, familiarizing myself. Facebook. And, uh, <laughs> Stand up, hands up. Yeah. And, uh, I'm the IT person. The IT person. <laughs> cool. So uh, helping us uh, put put some of the uh, uh, an early sample. Now this I did in the late fifties. So this is, this is your artwork. Yeah. Um, I saw a two, sort of a slick magazine. Uh, at that time, uh, and I sold a number of them on on uh, the early rock and roll stories. Well, if I remember correctly, to to this day, when you write a uh, story, you, you storyboard <laughs> it for the audience. Yeah, right? I always, I never write out there, but you know, it's a waste of words, and the artists appreciate it because they get a an immediate sense of uh, the direction I want to go in, and. They, I was surprised that uh, the names like John Severin and... Uh, uh, well, I, I, I want to talk to you about Severin uh, in a minute, but but let's just move ahead to uh, uh, further on in RT. So you began getting more and more work from them. Obviously, they liked what you did. And uh, I'm just going to shoot a couple of names at you. Just tell me your immediate sure. impression of them, all right? Harry Lucy. Uh, hmm. I, I would meet most of the Archie people only at the Christmas party that Archie gave. And um, I have no firm recollection of, uh, 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 I, I didn't know him that well. I, I remember seeing him a number of times. How about Sam Schwartz? Sam Schwartz, yes, a very good friend of mine. Um, I, I started early with the, the Jughead stories, and uh, he was very hmm. adept. At, uh, at, at writing the Jug Court stories. And between the two of us, I think we did it for maybe a decade or so. Mm. How about Dan DiCarlo? Oh, Dan DiCarlo, he, you know, uh, the icon of icons at Archie. Uh, uh, got to know him very well. And, um, he was just one nice fellow. And, uh, you know, we, we talk on the phone occasionally. And, he give me a tip as now's a good time to ask for a raise. <laughs> 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 and that was invaluable because uh, I, without that, I, I don't think uh, I would have. Uh, I, I might have been stuck at a lower level. But did you now? I, I want to ask you about Bats. Bats was this. Uh, anyone that doesn't know it, it was this wacky uh, comic. From from Archie, that was kind of a, a I don't know pre it, it was almost like there, not Brandeck, and uh, it, it was a comic that knew it was a comic, and it was very inventive, very funny, and uh, did you propose? Did you pitch that to the yeah, Archie? Yeah, yeah, it was nineteen around nineteen sixty two, I think, and um, by this time I had gotten Bacino. He he was interested just more as a fun thing. Um, doing work in Archie's Madhouse, etc., etc., And uh, you know, the rates, the comic book rates, couldn't compare to what he was earning as for one, one little panel. 
but mm -hmm. uh, he loved doing it. And I said, well, why don't we do uh, a book together? And uh, he, you know, he agreed. And we came up with that. The first issue was a colossal success. I think they sold, you know, in the millions. I hmm. exactly, yeah, exactly, I don't know. But comic, comic books that did well were, had that kind of circulation. And, uh, well, they were very enthused about it. Well, incidentally, we were the only ones that were allowed to uh, put our names in, in the books uh, mm. at that time. Uh, Basina did it anyway. You know, they were completely dependent on him. He, he not only penciled it, he drew, uh, inked it, and he uh, lettered it, and he would call up the colorists and tell them, uh, you know, you're, you're off base on, on the coloring, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it, Bats is, it's been reprinted by IDW recently. Oh, Am Bats? No, mm. that, that was is that, is that true? Madhouse. Someone is doing Bats, I think. Yeah, but but mm -hmm. Madhouse has been reprinted, and yeah. now did Madhouse come before or after that? Before, before, before. Okay, and you have done considerable work on Madhouse. Yeah, I, I started out about a year after it was published, and within within a year or so, I was doing the whole magazine uh, for 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 like eight or ten years. And and in Archie's Madhouse, that's where Sabrina was introduced. Yeah, in 1962. Two years before uh, the, the Witch came uh, on television. Not that I wasn't influenced by somebody, but Charles Adams, I have to take my hat off. I, I couldn't read enough of the work he did in uh, for New Yorker magazine, as well as several other cartoonists. If, if there's anybody whose work influenced me and taught Sabrina with uh, Charles Adams. He had uh, witches who were dressed as witches, but uh, living in contemporary times. And uh, so, did you ever dream, Sabrina? Was she going to no, be a continuing? No, character? I did a six-page story on her, uh, and uh, apparently they got a flood. Yeah, Archie rarely kept me informed of what was going on. <laughs> uh, and uh, they, um, what you call it, uh, told me to keep writing uh, Sabrina. So, but I was doing a whole bunch of other characters. So, okay. So, so who designed Sabrina? Did you tell Dan DeCola was the first artist on her? But uh, did you tell him that you wanted a certain look for her, like the the hair and the no, freckles? No, no. Uh, I did uh, a storyboard. I. I Drew it up. I don't know how, it, but I had a looking in mo mo uh, modern garb. But uh, yeah, you know, he uh, did the final. Well, you you, you guys created a, a true American classic. Did you ever think she'd go on to uh, TV and cartoons? Never. But they were thinking of, of making it into a twenty-five cents comic book, uh, mm -hmm. you know, real. Uh, class production. The books were selling for a dime then. And um, at this time, you know, they, they had instituted the comics code because of uh, uh, some other work that involved uh, violence and whatnot. And even though this was so humorous and uh, fun, drawn, exaggerated drawing, uh, they objected to the fact that I had werewolves and uh, bats and whatnot. <laughs> so um, they had me tone down the cover for issue number two, and I don't think it, it did as well. It was it showed uh, witches as young students, child type witches, and uh, uh, what what you call it. So. Um, I had to tone it down. And then also around this time, you know, we, 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 three or four issues had progressed and they hadn't raised uh, our salaries or anything. And uh, well, they were asking more and more casino and he had his regular work to do. So um, he, he sort of, just, it disappeared within, within a year. We're talking about mm. bats. Bats. Bats, okay. 
Um, so, yeah, so he went on to do, uh, he went back to his uh, yeah, commercial yeah. illustration. But just getting back to Sabrina, uh, that, that was an unexpected hit for them. Uh, do you want to tell how you found out that she was going to be the star of her own animated show? Yeah, uh, yeah. OK. Uh, over the next decade, I, I must have done about a, at least a dozen Sabrina stories. Uh, as I said, there were other characters I was involved with. Archie's uh, Madhouse. And then one day, uh, uh, I'm reading uh, the newspapers, and uh, I read where uh, Sabrina's going to be an animated TV show. And, you know, this was like a bolt of lightning, <laughs> <laughs> and, which prompted me to come out to California. Uh, and, and, Search of a job in animation, and I there's several stories here which I'll skip, but hmm. I, I did wind up uh, working for Filmation, and uh, uh, after a year I, I just didn't uh, I wasn't going anywhere, uh, you know they they weren't showing me. This was before I consulted my. Uh, <laughs> Editor, your best one editor. Yeah, so I, I, I couldn't have done any of the animation stories, and uh, and I never dropped Archie. I kept sending a weekly badge to them, so which was good because I just I loved California in '69, uh, in uh, 1970 when this was happening. We decided to just stay here. So uh, just look at. Forgive me if I'm just moving along, but running out of time, and I want there's so much I want to capture here. But you did uh, see Sabrina become a live action uh, to show, and you eventually met the star. Yeah, uh, Melissa uh, uh, Jane Hart, Jane Hart. and uh, at, at the L.A. Times uh, Festival of Books, uh, and this gentleman here. I think took some pictures at that time. Uh, no, no taking pictures. Took quite a few of my working with uh, yeah. Bill Leibowitz, mm -hmm. who, who was the most amazing comic book dealer uh, I've, I've ever encountered. He was such a PR expert. <laughs> He's the one who arranged, you know, for the our photo. Uh, it, it's I, been rotating it's out. Been for, for those who don't know Bill Leibowitz. Uh, own uh, Golden Apple uh, on Melrose, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I remember first hearing about the store, the store when Melrose wasn't a hipster place, and he kind of, I like to think he put that <laughs> strip on the map, but out there, the late Oh, that's uh, Pink's, 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 Pink's uh, Johnny oh, Grand. Oh, oh, yeah, this was, uh, oh, I, I did a story on El, the Archie Gang visiting L.A., and Bill Leibowitz, uh, suggested several places I could put in. One of them was Pete's Hot Dogs. And so it wound up, uh, <laughs> there's the uh, honorary mayor of uh, Hollywood. Uh, Johnny British, Grant. Yeah, Johnny Grant. And uh, there I am. And there were the guy with the guitar uh, and the lady next to Johnny Grant. Uh, were the ones who originally recorded Sugar Sugar and other Archie songs. And uh, of course, the guys with the big heads, uh, I think you're familiar with. Yeah. Well, 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 they're stars, you know. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, well, just moving, again, moving right along. And so to wrap up with Sabrina, now there's a movie coming. Yeah, yeah, and I've been assured that this time, uh, uh, I will be given the screen credit of the creator. Isn't that great? Yeah. All right, just, just moving right along. You also, at the same time, you were working for Crack, yep. cranking out uh, TV, movie parodies, gags. Yeah. Uh, you, you probably, actually, you, you probably worked with John, John Severin the most. Oh, what a, mm. what a fantastic. Cartoonist he was. I would say he was the most 
versatile as far as different art styles. And the amazing thing was that everybody would recognize, whether he did it in a serious, semi-serious, or cartoony way, uh, a real gag way, you could always tell it was uh, John Severin's work. And uh, I'm just so happy. Uh, I, I'm the, some 2,000 pages I sold to Crank. I, I, I did uh, a thousand with, with John, and it was a pleasure reading it. It, it boy, did it build up my ego, you know, uh, to see, did I write this stuff? Boy, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get involved with Craig? Hmm. Uh, I, uh, I was submitting to both Matt and, well, not to Craig. Yeah, I, I, I tried to sell hmm. them once. Uh, at the beginning of my venture in the cartooning, it didn't work. But about a year or so later, after I had had experience writing Archie's Madhouse, the initial Archie Madhouse stories, uh, many of them were in that uh, mad vein, mm -hmm. dealing with one subject over four or five pages. And, I, and the experience I got from the original gag card Tunes I did for uh, Broadway Labs and said for the same uh, enabled me to, to do that. Right. I said, skip. Well, crack was always the, the uh, uh, like, it always seemed like a cheap knockoff of, of, of Mad until Mort Todd came along and he kind of gave it a shot in the arm, gave it its own identity, and, and for a while made Bill Gaines very. Uh, nervous uh, <laughs> at the, the thought that this this little punk was nipping at his heels. Any thoughts about working with more Todd or uh, how the uh, arrangement at Crack changed when he took over? Yeah, he came in at a very critical time. Uh, the, uh, the original publisher, Bob Sproul, an editor, ran the magazine from, uh, from its inception until uh, the late 80s, uh, when his silent partner, who died, uh, left the business to his wife. And there was a critical stage when uh, Bob Sproul, I guess he was thinking of coming out with his own magazine or something, stopped uh, publishing, uh, I mean, stopped his influence with crack. And uh, the magazine was, um, bought by Globe and, uh, you know, the uh, gossip sheet. They did the National Enquirer. Uh, <laughs> no, the National Enquirer bought Globe and took it over and they were going <laughs> to start publishing it. In, in fact, they came out with a few editions uh, in Florida. But uh, that, uh, that that's a little later. Uh, what, what uh, 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 who were we talking Mort. about? Mort, Mort Todd. Uh, what he did, even though he was only there about four or five years uh, as, as the editor, uh, he said that he contacted Severin and a few of the other old timers like myself, and we, we continued and he resumed. But he also ventured into um, uh, reprints and uh, uh, bringing up our old monster work on monsters, etc. And I know it. I, I talked with a British writer once uh, at the, at the con, uh, the guy who, who was involved in writing Judge Dredd, and he told me at one time in England, that Cracked was as big as Mad. It came as a surprise to me. Well, just moving. I'm, I'm so afraid of just cutting off before we get to. Juicy stuff. Where uh, we'll, we'll do it now. Some uh, some odd predictions you did under the guise of uh, writing funny stories, and they yeah. came true. Yeah. Uh, what you might call it? Uh, I took a I tracked a backward glance at, at the past from the standpoint of forty or fifty years hence, and in one uh, such article, I had John Lennon. I remember I wrote this in the early 60s, being killed by, at the hands of his fans. 
mm. which happened, mm. I don't know what, uh, back in the 70s or something. 1980. 1980. And uh, there were a few other things, like predicting that 20 years before its inception, there would be a rock and roll uh, museum. And then, like a Hall of Fame. Yeah, Hall of Fame. And uh, a few other uh, items like that. But the most uh, bizarre uh, thing that ever happened in, uh, in comics there for me was uh, Bill Leibowitz, getting back to him. He showed me a, a telegram. I, I guess maybe you, you've seen it. Uh, not a telegram. It looked like a telegram, but it was a letter from Phil Spector saying, uh, oh, Bill, you, I, I put Bill in a couple, couple of stories. He said, Bill, you're so lucky. I wish I'd give up one of my gold records if, if I could be an Archie Comics. <laughs> so, you know, I, <laughs> and it said, and I put Phil Spector in uh, one page. Yeah, it's been rotating. It's been rotating. Where Phil Spector comes to uh, uh, the uh, book show up in Los Angeles, and Archie, the Archies are there, and they're so enthusiastic at meeting this celebrity. Uh, they want to give him a, a recording of their music, etc., etc. So I, I didn't think much of it, and I, I guess Phil Spector liked it, even though we never got that gold record. <laughs> but what, what made this very unusual. A couple of years later, maybe two or three, uh, I'm doing a show with Bill Leibowitz at a comic book show in uh, Pasadena. It was a, a small LA convention. Yeah, in Glendale. And uh, <laughs> at our booth, it was a big booth. Uh, in, uh, what you might call it, uh, uh, Bill had uh, uh, several, I don't know whether they were, whether they were actresses or... Oh, screen queens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and one of them was uh, this woman who sat on my right. She was very attractive, but I hardly paid any attention to her because there was another one who was wearing eight inch eight inch heel shoes. Be, be careful, you're our number one editor. So <laughs> and uh, I was yeah, going to well. <laughs> yeah. uh, put her in a, I said, gee, this is great for a Betty and Veronica story. And uh, I didn't think much uh, of that incident. Uh, in fact, I didn't remember any of the names except uh, what you call it, that Leibowitz told me she was the one who was killed. Her name was Lana Clark. That that night. Oh. So there I'm sitting next to her, and uh, God, uh, it was spooky. Well, I I hearing this for the first time, and the, Phil Spector was in an Archie story where Archie gave him a demo of the Archie. That might have drove him to murder. You know, I think <laughs> but anyway, just moving. <laughs> Very quickly, because we're running out of time, and I'd like to get one or two questions in for George here. George was the first American hired uh, by the Japanese to uh, uh, be involved in manga, and you did a strip, the first American, I think, to, to specifically do a strip for the Japanese market. Yeah. Actually, there may have been one or two other Americans, but they were unrelated to the comic book field. Right. And this... Uh, uh, they had, at the 1991 uh, uh, Comic Con, they had uh, Kodansha had a, a booth, and they proposed uh, doing. Uh, a, they asked for, for a sample uh, strip that they, they might want to publish, etc. So, I, I, in writing for Crack, I, I recall writing. Uh, uh, several articles on the Japanese and you know the way they behave, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so I came up with 
I went home, and Mary drove me home. That, instead of staying at our hotel that night, I drew up the um, a sample idea I had for them. And we came back the next day, I submitted it, and uh, that was the one they picked. And how long did the feature run? Uh, about three or four years. And uh, there were 68 episodes altogether. Hmm. Uh, and the Japanese, it was basically a, a, a foreigner looking in a humorous way at the, 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 uh, the Japanese. His intention was not to look humorous, but you know, do a serious take, but the whole thing was presented in a humorous way. And they liked it, and, um, and what, what is that true? Uh, I wish I'd brought the book here. Uh, uh, and uh, wow, the, the, the Japanese, uh, the way they uh, treat their artists and uh, comic book writers, uh, a little different than uh, <laughs> in this country. First of all, they gave us full rights to it after three years. Hmm. Both to the Japanese artists I worked with and, and myself. And also, uh, uh, they were very gentle when they reprinted the books. They were very generous with uh, uh, the reprint on it. And you know, nowadays you, you get reprinted and nothing happens <laughs> uh, in this country. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, what did he wait? 10 minutes to 5 minutes? Yeah. Don't worry, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> okay, don't worry. I'll, 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 I'll cut you off. <laughs> don't worry. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so, um, <laughs> you know, oh, and. Um, the um, the Japanese cartoonists I worked with, they, you know, not only did they, the um, Kadansha treat my wife and me to a two-week trip um, in, the, in the course of our, our work so that we'd learn more about Japan. But they, after it was over, they, um, they gave the Japanese cartoonists uh, a similar trip back here, and we, we invited him to spend his two weeks with us. And, uh, what was I was gonna say, uh, oh, uh, I took him around, and one of the places I took him to was to have dinner with Sheldorf. Mm -hmm. uh, and we went to Sheldorf's apartment, and, uh, uh, would you like the lights are out there. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, uh, uh, Shell Dorf, not only got, uh, not only did I put him in several Archie stories, but uh, uh, I, I fondly looked at the, uh, hit the his being in the, the uh, Japanese uh, hmm. manga, which he enjoyed too. Speaking of Shell, you and him had uh, something in common. Your oh, big yeah. Film buffs. yeah. Yeah. Uh, about 20 years ago, well, I knew him almost from the beginning, you know, just to say hello, etc. And when we got to talking about movies, so he uh, said, why don't I uh, come to this uh, Cinecon that's held every year in Los Angeles during the Labor Day weekend. And so for 20 years thereafter, uh, my wife and I attend uh, Cinecon. We got to be very close friends uh, over that time. And with, uh, our conversation always dealt with the movies. I mean, this Cinecon uh, not only dealt with silent movies, but movies in the early talkies, uh, 30s, 40s, fewer in the 50s. So, uh, oh, the only time I've ever seen Sheldon Dorff get mad, and boy, was he mad, uh, we're discussing Betty Hutton. Hmm. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't particularly uh, care for her. I, she's a little frantic, uh, if you've seen some of her movies. And boy, did he take umbrage at me. <laughs> very angry. She came from the same hometown that he came hmm. from. And I guess he knew her or something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I never brought up any other <laughs> Well, before we uh, get to 
quick questions. I, I just want to mention, yeah, George is still creating, uh, I'm not at liberty to tell, to tell you some of the ideas that he, he tells me, but he does have one in progress, Cindy and her Obasan. Yeah. And could you just briefly yeah. talk about uh, her? Yeah, uh, originally uh, Stan Goldberg and our he has a, a great Archie Couture's return. I know after Dan DeCarlo, I mean, uh, he, he ranks right up there. He, he, and he is so uh, fast there. And mm. uh, so we came up with the, this idea, um, you know, using my experience with Japan um, as a background. With Cindy, and, you know, short for Cinderella, uh, and her Japanese fairy godmother. But they're, 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 uh, it's a digital organization, the fairy godmothers, are, they're going global and high tech. <laughs> and uh, we came out with a comic book, which was uh, really just uh, a starter of the thing. And uh, I, we making uh, quite a number of changes. And the comic book was 32 pages, and I really couldn't get into the Japanese scene that well. So uh, I'm hoping to uh, finish that project. And, and what, what's a, what does Obasan mean? Uh, it, it's like a good natured term, auntie or, or godmother. Godmother, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but anyway, be on the look, it's still a work in progress. Rorschach Press, I don't even know if they're still in business, they, they printed the, uh, the, the first version of it. So if you can find it, it's worth your while. Stan's work is great. Does anyone have any questions for George? Any uh, inside info about watching? Let's go back to that affair you were talking about uh, with uh, Matt. <laughs> Someone was shacking up with a young lady or something. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, I'm not just the name. Yeah, we did. Just, <laughs> name, just names, please. Uh, yeah. If I forget the name, please. President, uh, yes. So, uh, <laughs> and, and, but here's what I, I can't get a straight answer from any of the publishers. I mean, hmm. I think go hell, high water, find who owns the rights to those crack stories that George hmm. and John Severin did because. The, I mean, even as a kid, it was like, wow, just look at the character. I mean, Severin just had a knack for caricature that was just, I mean, you know, I, I think he was right up there with more Drucker, even though it wasn't the same type of uh, approach. It was still knockout uh, cartooning, and someone should just do a beautiful volume, and of course get George to write the introduction to it. <laughs> uh, what you would call it, John Severin's work is you know, famous for what he did with uh, Marvel and uh, all the DC. other uh, publishers. But uh, the work he did for the crack, and he must have done uh, 5,000 pages or more, uh, was simply uh, fantastic in that he had to express himself so versatilely. Uh, well, you, you, you're, you hit on a great idea, uh, you know, reproducing his work. But apparently the copyright for those, like they've changed hands so often, no one knows exactly who owns what. And I think the negatives are being held hostage somewhere. Ah, so. Just something clear. Hmm. Go ahead. Uh, what you call it, as I said, Globe had it, and then it was taken over by the National Enquirer. Right. Their, their, their comic book tank. But, uh, did you, May have recall uh, there was this dope, uh, not, a, not a dope, but uh, some poisonous uh, powdery stuff put oh, right, right. in the mail. The anthrax. Uh, anthrax, that's it. Yeah. And uh, I believe all the crack negatives that's right. were destroyed. Because they thought it was tainted. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But still, with, with mm. scanning and, I mean, I think. You know. Well, I have all the issues. There we go. Who wants to <laughs> Someone talk to IDW, they're going to be here. <laughs> or Dark Horse, if you know anyone there. Which I do. So, uh, I've been trying to convince them for a while. But, uh, again, anyone questions? We still 
I don't see the flashing sign. So we still have a few, a few minutes. Anyone? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I'm just curious about, you know, back in the day when you said you were in the Eisner Iger shop, it was probably yeah. after the split, if it's in 40. Can you, can you name, like, for example, was Bob Fujitani there? Does hmm. he ring a bell? One of the artists? I, mean, I, mean, I don't think so. I think he was actually at Busy Arnold's. But no, I don't remember. Can you name, because it wasn't either and either shouldn't have been by 1940. 1942 was I. Yeah, 42. yeah, it was Jumbo Comics with yeah. the, the book they were putting out. Uh, no, I had no, nothing about any other you know, organization. Was Lou Fine tucked away in a room? Who's the hmm. quality comics in the busy area? He could have been, but I. As I said, the only name I remembered was the letter. He was the focal point. Okay. And it, it didn't seem to be a big star. I'm going to track down that letter, yeah, too. It doesn't. <laughs> yeah, I know somebody I, I, who, who, who would know the editor. But, but, I mean, what? The, um, the, uh, the letter. <laughs> By the way, you met Eisner later on in life and yeah. told him that you worked in his studio. Uh, what was his reaction? Do you remember? Uh, no, I didn't. You know, I met him a, a number of times, but somehow. Uh, you know, it didn't seem that significant. I, I, I didn't have to adopt that historical attitude. You know, uh, looking back at who, who was doing what and what. Uh, no, I, uh, I never did bring it up. I'm sorry I didn't. Mm -hmm. In fact, winning that Eisner Award in <laughs> uh, 2003, uh, mm -hmm. about and, and George is also the recipient of the Bill Finger Award, so which is a, a, a great thing that they give for uh, writers, acknowledging those journeyman writers. Well, thank you all. I really appreciate it. Let's have a big hand for George. And thanks for coming. <laughs>